peaceful development. Strengthen the foundation for pursuing peaceful development. January 28th, 2013. Main points of the speech at the third group study session of the Political Bureau of the 18th CPC Central Committee, which she presided over. To pursue peaceful development in keeping with the development trend of the times and China's fundamental interests is a strategic choice made by our party. We should, under the guidance of Deng Xiaoping theory, the important thought of the three represents, and the scientific outlook on development enhance our strategic thinking and confidence, and better balance China's overall domestic and international interests. We should pursue mutually beneficial development, featuring openness and cooperation. Develop China by securing a peaceful international environment and, at the same time, uphold and promote world peace through our own development. We should continuously improve China's overall national strength. Make sure that the people share the benefits of peaceful development and consolidate the material and social foundations for pursuing peaceful development. The Chinese nation loves peace. To abolish war and achieve peace has been the most pressing and profound aspiration of the Chinese people since the advent of modern times. Pursuing peaceful development is what the fine traditional Chinese culture calls for, and it is a natural choice made by the Chinese people who have suffered so much in modern times. With the agonizing sufferings inflicted by war etched in our memory, we Chinese cherish peace and stability. What we abhor is turbulence. What we want is stability. And what we hope to see is world peace. Our pursuit of peaceful development was not an easygoing process. Rather, this pursuit was made possible thanks to the CPC's arduous quest and endeavors since the founding of the PRC in 1949, and, in particular, to the introduction of the Reform and Opening Up Initiative in 1978. Our party has always upheld peace and never wavered in this commitment. Over the years, we have put forward and adhered to the five principles of peaceful coexistence, and adopted and followed an independent foreign policy of peace. And we have made a solemn pledge to the whole world that we will never seek hegemony or commit any act of expansion, and that China is and will remain a staunch force for upholding world peace. We remain true to these commitments, and we remain firm in honoring them. The CPC put forward at its 18th National Congress the two centenary goals. We have also put forward the goal of achieving the Chinese dream, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. To realize these goals, we need a peaceful international environment. Neither China nor the rest of the world can develop without peace, nor can they enjoy lasting peace without development. We must seize the opportunity and run our own affairs well, 
so as to make our country stronger and more prosperous, and our people lead a better life. This will enable us to pursue peaceful development by relying on our own growing strength. The tide of history is mighty. Those who follow it will prosper, while those who resist it will perish. Looking back on our history, we can see that those who launched aggression or sought expansion by force all ended in failure. This is a law of history. A prosperous and stable world provides China with opportunities, and China's development also offers an opportunity for the world as a whole. Whether we will succeed in our pursuit of peaceful development to a large extent hinges on whether we can turn opportunities in the rest of the world into China's opportunities and China's opportunities into those for the rest of the world, so that China and other countries can engage in sound interactions and make mutually beneficial progress. We must act in keeping with China's national conditions and stick to our own path. At the same time, we should acquire a global vision. In this way, we can both promote China's domestic development and open the country wider to the outside world and advance both China's development and the development of the world as a whole as well as the interests of both the Chinese people and other peoples. In this way, we can continuously expand mutually beneficial cooperation with other countries, be actively involved in international affairs, address global challenges together with other countries, and contribute our share to global development. While pursuing peaceful development, we will never sacrifice our legitimate rights and interests or China's core interests. No foreign country should expect China to trade off its core interests or swallow bitter fruit that undermines China's sovereignty, security, or development interests. China is pursuing peaceful development, and so are other countries. This is the sure way for all the countries in the world to seek common development and peaceful coexistence. We should let the world learn more about China's strategy of pursuing peaceful development and let the international community view China's development for what it is, and treat it accordingly. China will never seek development at the expense of any other country's interests, nor will it shift its problems onto others. We will actively pursue peaceful and common development, uphold the multilateral trading system, and participate in global economic governance. Work together for mutually beneficial cooperation. June 19th, 2013 and May 19th, 2014. Main Points of Talks with Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations. 1. As well as its many important missions, the United Nations, UN, carries the expectations of the peoples of all countries. The world is undergoing dramatic and complex changes and it requires the joint efforts 
of all UN member states to address global issues and challenges. The UN should grasp the theme of peace and development, uphold fairness and justice, and speak and act justly. The time of the zero-sum mentality is past, so we should work together for mutually beneficial cooperation instead. The UN should contribute to this. China has set forth the two centenary goals as a grand blueprint for its future development. China needs the UN, and the UN needs China. China values the UN and will support it. China's permanent membership of the UN Security Council entails not only power, but also responsibility. Responsibility that it is ready to shoulder. China will continue to work for the peaceful resolution of international disputes and support the UN in achieving its Millennium Development Goals. China is willing to work with all parties in addressing climate change and other problems, and to do whatever it can for world peace and human progress. June 19th, 2013. Two. The year 2015 will mark the 70th anniversary of victory in the World Anti-Fascist War, 1941-1945, and the victory of the Chinese People's War of Resistance against Japanese Aggression, 1937-1945. Footnote 1. The War of Resistance Against Japanese Aggression refers to a war of national liberation against Japanese invasion from July 1937 to September 1945. It was an important part of World War II. After arduous and prolonged battles, the Chinese people finally defeated the Japanese aggressors with great sacrifice. The war was the first complete victory achieved by the Chinese people against foreign aggression since the advent of modern times. It was also a great contribution to the victory of the World Anti-Fascist War. End of footnote one. It will also mark the 70th anniversary of the founding of the UN. The world community should avail itself of this important opportunity to reiterate its commitment to multilateralism, safeguard the principles set forth in the UN Charter, and commit itself to strengthening the role of the UN. The world community should make concerted efforts to promote world peace and development. First, seeking political solutions is the right path to address the seemingly endless sequence of international flashpoints. Just when you press the gourd into the water, there floats the gourd ladle. Footnote 2. A traditional Chinese saying that means tackling one problem only to find another emerging. End of footnote 2. These issues must be tackled properly and reasonably. Exerting pressure won't work, and external military intervention will make things worse. 
both the UN and the rest of the international community should adhere to political solutions to all conflicts. Second, the world community should adhere to the goal of common development. The UN should play its political and coordinating role and exploit its moral advantage. It should formulate its post-2015 development agenda with poverty alleviation at its core to achieve sustainable growth. China wishes every success for the UN Climate Summit in September. Third, the UN should play a leading role in international affairs. Regarding the fight against terrorism, the UN should play a bigger role by promoting clear-cut clear cut criteria of right and wrong so as to advance the fight against terrorism of all forms. It should also serve as the main channel in protecting cyber security. Advocate rules, sovereignty, and transparency in this regard. Respect the concerns of different countries over information safety and achieve common management. China will continue to firmly support the UN. May 19, 2014. Follow a sensible, coordinated, and balanced approach to nuclear security. March 24, 2014. Speech at the Nuclear Security Summit in The Hague, the Netherlands. Your Excellency Prime Minister Mark Rutt. Dear colleagues, today we are meeting here at The Hague for an important discussion on ways to enhance nuclear security. First of all, I wish to express heartfelt thanks to Prime Minister Rutt and the Dutch government for the active efforts and considerate arrangements they have made for this summit. During the 20th century, the discovery of the atom and the subsequent develop and utilization of nuclear energy gave new impetus to the progress of humanity and greatly enhanced our ability to understand and shape the world. Yet, the development of nuclear energy has its associated risks and challenges. To make better use of nuclear energy and achieve great progress, mankind must be able to respond to various nuclear security challenges and ensure the safety of nuclear materials and facilities. Dear colleagues, enhancing nuclear security is a never-ending process. As long as we continue to tap nuclear energy, we must maintain our efforts in enhancing nuclear security. From Washington, D.C. in 2010, to Seoul in 2012, and to The Hague today, the Nuclear Security Summit, NSS, has the great responsibility of building international consensus in this regard and deepening nuclear security efforts. We must take a sensible, coordinated, and balanced approach to nuclear security and keep it on track of sound and sustainable development. First, we should place equal emphasis on development and security and develop nuclear energy on the premise of security. 
The peaceful use of nuclear energy is important for ensuring energy security and tackling climate change. Like Prometheus who gave fire to humanity, the peaceful use of nuclear energy has sparked a flame of hope and opened up a bright future for mankind. But without effective safeguards for nuclear safety and without an adequate response to the potential security risks of nuclear materials and facilities, such a bright future will be overshadowed by dark clouds or even by nuclear disaster. Therefore, we must strictly abide by the principles of making safety the top priority if we are to keep the flame of hope for nuclear energy development burning. We must follow the approach of enhancing security for the sake of development and promoting development by upholding security and bring the goals of development and security in alignment with each other. We must convince the governments and nuclear power companies of all countries that developing nuclear energy at the expense of security can neither be sustainable nor bring real development. Only by adopting credible steps and safeguards can we keep risks under effective control and develop nuclear energy in a sustainable way. Second, we should place equal emphasis on rights and obligations and push forward the international nuclear security process on the basis of respecting the rights and interests of all countries. Nothing can be accomplished without norms and standards. All countries should earnestly fulfill their obligations under international legal instruments relating to nuclear security. Fully implement the relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Consolidate and strengthen the existing legal framework governing nuclear security and provide institutional support and universally accepted guidelines for international efforts to enhance nuclear security. China hopes that more countries will consider ratifying the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material and its Amendment, and the International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. Countries differ in national conditions and the status of their nuclear power development, and the nuclear security challenges they face also vary from one to another. As the saying goes, you need different keys to open different locks. While stressing the importance of countries honoring their international obligations, we should respect their right to adopt nuclear security policies and measures best suited to their specific conditions, as well as their right to protect sensitive nuclear security information. We should adopt a fair and pragmatic attitude and advance the international nuclear security process in an active yet prudent manner. Third, we should place equal emphasis on independent and collaborative efforts and seek universal nuclear security through mutually beneficial cooperation. Nuclear security is first and foremost a national goal and the primary responsibility must be borne by national governments. They must understand and fulfill their responsibilities. 
develop a stronger awareness of nuclear security. Foster a nuclear security culture. Strengthen institutions and enhance technological capacity. This is the responsible thing to do, not only for their own sake, but also for the good of the world as a whole. Nuclear security is also a global endeavor. The amount of water a barrel can hold is determined by its shortest stop. The loss of nuclear material is one in, in one country can be a threat to the whole world. A concerted global effort is therefore required to achieve universal nuclear security. We must bring more countries into the international nuclear security process and try to turn it into a global undertaking so that all will contribute to and benefit from it. We should strengthen exchanges to learn from each other and share experiences and improve coordination between the relevant multilateral mechanisms and initiatives. Although the starting line may be different for different countries, we should make sure that no one falls behind in this common endeavor. Fourth, we should place equal emphasis on treating symptoms and addressing causes and advance the nuclear security endeavor in all respects with the goal of removing the associated risks at the root. The issue of nuclear security has many dimensions from exercising sound and effective management to developing advanced and secure nuclear energy technologies and to dealing with nuclear terrorism and nuclear proliferation. To eliminate the potential risks of nuclear security and nuclear proliferation in a direct and effective way, we must improve relevant policies and measures, develop modern low-risk nuclear energy technologies, maintain balanced supply and demand of nuclear materials, strengthen non-proliferation efforts and export control, and step up international cooperation against nuclear terrorism. But, more importantly, we must tackle the root causes. We need to foster a peaceful and stable international environment, encourage harmonious and friendly relations between countries, and conduct exchanges among different civilizations in an amicable and open-minded manner. This is the only way to tackle the root causes of nuclear terrorism and nuclear proliferation, and to achieve lasting security and development of nuclear energy. Dear colleagues, China gives top priority to nuclear security in the peaceful use of nuclear energy, and manages nuclear materials and facilities according to the highest standards. China has maintained a good record of nuclear security in the past 50 years and more. According to Dutch philosopher Erasmus, prevention is better than cure. The horrific nuclear accidents of the past few years have rung the alarm bell for all of us, and we must do whatever we can to prevent a recurrence of past tragedies. As a precautionary step, China has tightened nuclear security measures across the board. We have made great efforts to improve our technology 
and emergency response and conducted comprehensive security checks on nuclear facilities across the country to make sure that all nuclear materials and facilities are placed under effective safeguards. We have adopted and implemented a medium and long-term program on nuclear security and improved the relevant legal framework. And we are in the process of drafting national regulations with a view to putting our nuclear security endeavors on an institutional and legal footing. China is actively promoting international cooperation on nuclear security, beginning with the Center of Excellence on Nuclear Security, a joint project between China and the United States. Construction of the center is well underway. It will contribute to technical exchanges and cooperation on nuclear security in the region and beyond. China has also launched a number of cooperation projects with Russia and Kazakhstan to combat illicit trafficking of nuclear materials. China supports the efforts to reduce to a minimum the use of highly enriched uranium, HEU, when economically and technologically feasible, and is helping Ghana convert an HEU field research reactor to one using low enrichment uranium within the IAEA framework. China has also made contributions to the IAEA Nuclear Security Fund and helped enhance the nuclear security capability of Asia-Pacific countries through hosting training sessions and a variety of other ways. Dear colleagues, where light inches forward, darkness retreats. The more we do to enhance nuclear security, the fewer opportunities we will offer to terrorists. To achieve lasting nuclear security, China will continue its efforts in the following areas. First, China will stay firmly committed to strengthening its own nuclear security capability. We will continue to enhance the government's regulatory capacity, increase investments in relevant technological development and human resources, and foster and develop a nuclear security culture. Second, China will stay firmly committed to building an international nuclear security system. We will work with other countries to build an international nuclear security system featuring fairness and mutually beneficial cooperation and encourage countries to share the fruits of the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Third, China will stay firmly committed to supporting international cooperation on nuclear security. We stand ready to share technology, experience, resources, and platforms to promote regional and international nuclear security cooperation. China supports the IAEA's leading role and encourages it to help developing countries build their nuclear security capacity. China will continue to take an active part in nuclear security activities and invite the IAEA to conduct an international physical protection advisory service. Fourth, China will stay firmly committed to upholding regional and global 
peace, and stability. We will continue to pursue peaceful development and mutually beneficial cooperation, handle differences and disputes through equality-based dialogue and friendly consultations, and work with all other countries to remove the root causes of nuclear terrorism and nuclear proliferation. Dear colleagues, to strengthen nuclear security is our shared commitment and common responsibility. Let us work together so that the people of the whole world will have more confidence in lasting nuclear security and the benefits of nuclear energy brings them. Thank you. Exchanges and mutual learning make civilizations richer and more colorful. March 27th, 2014. Part of the speech at the UNESCO headquarters. Civilizations become richer and more colorful through exchanges and mutual learning, which form an important driver for human progress and global peace and development. To promote exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations, we must adopt a correct approach with some important principles. They, in my view, contain the following. First, Civilizations come in different colors, and such diversity has made exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations relevant and valuable. Just as the sunlight has seven colors, our world is a place of dazzling colors. A civilization is the collective memory of a country or a nation. Throughout history, Mankind has created and developed many colorful civilizations. From the earliest days of primitive hunting to the period of agriculture, and from booming industrial revolution to the information society, together they present a magnificent genetic map of the exciting march of human civilizations. A single flower does not make spring, while one hundred flowers in full blossom bring spring to the garden. If there were only one kind of flower in the world, people would find it boring no matter how beautiful it was. Be it Chinese civilization or other civilizations in the world, they are all fruits of human progress. I have visited the Louvre Museum in France and the Palace Museum in China both of which house millions of art treasures. They are attractive because they present the richness of diverse civilizations. Exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations must not be built on the exclusive praise or belittling of one particular civilization. As early as over 2,000 years ago, the Chinese people came to recognize that it is natural for things to be different. Footnote 1. The Mencius. Mengzi. End of footnote 1. Greater exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations can further enrich the colors of of various civilizations and the cultural life of people and open up still greater alternatives in the future. Second, civilizations are equal and such equality has made exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations possible. 
all human civilizations are equal in value and they all have their respective strengths and weaknesses. No civilization is perfect on the planet, nor is it devoid of merit. No single civilization can be judged superior to another. I have visited many places in the world. What interested me most during the trips was to learn about differing civilizations across the five continents, what makes them different and unique how their people think about the world, and life, and what they hold dear. I have visited Chechen Itza, a window on the ancient Maya civilization, and the central Asian city of Samarkand, an icon of the ancient Islamic civilization. It is my keenly felt conviction that an attitude of equality and modesty is required if one wants to truly understand various civilizations. Taking a condescending attitude towards a civilization cannot help anyone to appreciate its essence and may risk antagonizing it. Both history and reality show that pride and prejudice are the biggest obstacles to exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations. Third, civilizations are inclusive, and such inclusiveness has given exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations the impetus to move forward. The ocean is vast because it refuses no rivers. All civilizations are crystallizations of mankind's diligence and wisdom. Every civilization is unique. Copying other civilizations blindly or mechanically is like cutting one's toes to fit one's shoes. Impossible and highly detrimental. All achievements of civilization deserve our respect and must be cherished. History proves that only by interacting with and learning from others can a civilization enjoy full vitality. If all civilizations are inclusive, the so-called clash of civilizations can be avoided and the harmony of civilizations will become reality. As a Chinese saying goes, radish or cabbage, each to his own delight. Having gone through over 5,000 years of vicissitudes, the Chinese civilization has always kept to its original root. As an icon, it contains the most profound pursuits of the Chinese nation and provides it with abundant nourishment for existence and development. Deriving from Chinese soil, it has come to its present form through constant exchanges with and learning from other civilizations. In the second century BC, China started the Silk Road, leading to the Western regions. Footnote 2. The Silk Road was a trade thoroughfare on land connecting ancient China with South Asia, Western Asia, Europe, and North Africa through Central Asia. The name derives from the bustling trade in silk and silk products from China to the Western regions. End of footnote 2. In 138 BC and 119 BC, Envoy Zhang Qian 
of the Han Dynasty, 206 BC to AD 220, made two trips to those regions, disseminating Chinese culture and bringing China into China grapes, alfalfa, pomegranates, flax, sesame, and other products. Footnote 3. Zhang Qian, unknown to 114 BC, was a minister of the Western Han Dynasty. He was dispatched by Emperor Wu Di as an envoy to the Western regions, a historical name specified in the Han Dynasty that referred to the regions west of Yu Men and Yang Guan passes in 138 BC and 119 BC, respectively, to seek alliances among local ethnic groups to fight against the Xiong Nu, an aggressive tribe. His travels, as far as Central Asia today, tightened the ties between the Central Plains and the Western regions and contributed remarkably to the opening of the ancient Silk Road. End of footnote 3. During the Western Han Dynasty, 206 BC to AD 25, China's merchant fleets sailed as far as India and Sri Lanka, where they traded China's silk for colored glaze, pearls, and other products. The Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907, saw dynamic interactions between China and other countries. Historical records reveal that China exchanged envoys with more than 70 countries, and Chang'an, the capital of Tang, bustled with envoys, merchants, and students from other countries. Exchanges of such a magnitude helped spread Chinese culture to the rest of the world and introduce other cultures and products to China. During the 15th century, Zheng Hai, a famous navigator of the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644, made seven expeditions to the Western Seas, reaching many Southeast Asian countries and even Kenya on the eastern coast of Africa, leaving behind many stories of friendly exchanges between China and countries along the route. Footnote 4. Zheng He, 1371 to 1433, was a navigator of the Ming Dynasty. He began his service at the imperial court in the early Ming Dynasty and was later promoted to be the Grand Director, Taijian, of the Directorate of Palace Services. He eventually served as chief envoy during his seven Grand Sea voyages between 1405 and 1433, when he traveled to more than 30 countries and regions in Asia and Africa, including Southeast Asian countries, the Indian Ocean, and the Red Sea, as well as the east coast of Africa and Mecca, the sacred place for Islamic pilgrimages. Zheng He was a Muslim. His expeditions were dubbed treasure voyages, which greatly boosted the economic and cultural exchanges between China and other Asian and African countries. End of footnote 4. During the late Ming and early Qing, 1644 to 1911 dynasties, the Chinese people began to access modern science and technology through the introduction of European knowledge in the realms of astronomy, medicine, mathematics, geometry, and geography, which helped broaden the horizon of Chinese people. Thereafter, 
exchanges and mutual learning between Chinese civilization and other civilizations became more frequent. Naturally, there were conflicts, frictions, bewilderment, and denial, but the more dominant features of the period were learning, digestion, integration, and innovation. Buddhism originated in ancient India. After it was brought to China, the religion went through an extended period of integrated development with the indigenous Confucianism and Taoism, and finally became Buddhism with Chinese features, thus greatly impacting the religious beliefs, philosophy, literature, art, etiquette, and customs of China. Xuan Zong, an eminent monk of the Tang Dynasty, who endured untold sufferings as he went on a pilgrimage to ancient India for Buddhist scriptures, gave full expression to the determination and fortitude of the Chinese people to learn from other cultures. Footnote 5. Xuan Zong, 600 or 602 to 644, also known as Tong Sin, was an eminent monk of the Tong dynasty, translator of Buddhist scriptures, and co founder of the Binat Timatatra Consciousness Only School. He requested to take Buddhist orders at the age of 13, after which time he learned from many masters who confused him with different ideas, causing him a dream of journey to India, the western regions. His dream came true in 629 or 627, when he headed to India for the study of Buddhist sutras. After his return to Chang'an, capital of the Tang Dynasty, Xuanzang committed himself to translating 75 Buddhist scriptures in 1,335 volumes and writing a book, Great Tang Records on the Western Regions, Da Tang Shi Yu Ji. End of footnote 5. I am sure you have heard of the Chinese mythological classical novel Journey to the West based on his stories. Footnote 6. Journey to the West. Shi Yo Ji is a mythical novel attributed to Wu Cheng En, circa 1500 to circa 1582, a novelist of the Ming Dynasty. It recounts the legendary pilgrimage of the Tang Dynasty monk Tang Sung, Xuan Zong, who traveled to the western regions, India, to obtain sacred texts, sutras, with his three disciples, Sun Wukong, Monkey King, Zhu Bai Zhe, Pig of the Eight Prohibitions, and Sha Wu Jing, Friar Sand, and returned after many trials and much suffering, subduing demons and monsters. It is dubbed one of the four great classical novels of Chinese literature the other three being The Three Kingdoms, Outlaws of the Marsh, and A Dream of Red Mansions. End of footnote 6. The Chinese people enriched Buddhism and developed some special Buddhist thoughts in the light of Chinese culture and helped it spread from China to Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, and beyond. 
Over the last 2,000 years, religions such as Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity have been introduced into China, nurturing the country's music, painting, and literature. China's freehand oil painting, for instance, is an innovative combination of its own traditional painting and Western oil painting, and the works by Xu Bei Hong and other master painters have been widely acclaimed. Footnote 7. Xu Bei Hong, 1895-1953, was a master painter and fine arts educator. End of footnote 7. China's four great inventions, papermaking, gunpowder, printing, and the compass, brought drastic changes to the whole world, including the European Renaissance. Its philosophy, literature, medicine, silk, porcelain, and tea have been shared by the West and become part of its people's life. The book, Travels of Marco Polo, provoked widespread interest in China. I think some of you might be familiar with the terracotta warriors and horses of the Qin Dynasty, 221 to 207 BC, one of the eight wonders in the world. Footnote 8. Terracotta Warriors and Horses of the Qin Dynasty, 221 to 207 BC, were archaeological discoveries from the mausoleum of Emperor Ying Jing, 259 to 210 BC, or the first emperor of Qin, the first to unify feudal China. They were listed as one of UNESCO's World Cultural Heritage Sites in 1987. End of footnote 8. After his visit to the site, President Chirac of France remarked that a visit to Egypt would not be complete without seeing the pyramids and that a visit to China would not be complete without seeing the terracotta warriors and horses. In 1987, this national treasure was listed as one of UNESCO's World Cultural Heritage Sites. Many Chinese legacies are ranked as World Cultural Heritage Sites, and World Intangible Cultural Heritage Sites are listed and are listed on the Memory of the World Register. Here, I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to UNESCO for its contribution to the preservation and dissemination of Chinese civilization. Today, we live in a world with different cultures, ethnic groups, skin colors, religions, and social systems, and all people on the planet have become members of an intimate community with a shared destiny. The Chinese people have long come to appreciate the concept of harmony without uniformity. Footnote 9. See Note 11, page 100. 97. End of footnote 9. Zhou Chu Ming, a Chinese historian who lived 2,500 years ago, recorded a few lines by Yan Zi, Prime Minister of the State of Qi during the spring and autumn period, 770 to 476 B.C. In Zhuo's Chronicles, Zhuo Zhuang. 
Harmony is like cooking thick soup. You need water, fire, vinegar, meat sauce, salt, and plum to go with the fish or meat. It is the same with music. Only by combining the texture, length, rhythm, mood, tone, pitch, and style adequately and executing them properly can you produce an excellent melody. Who can tolerate soup with nothing but water in it? Who can tolerate the same tone played again and again with one instrument? Footnote 10 Zuo Chu Ming, 556 to 451 BC, was a historian in the state of Lu during the spring and autumn period. End of footnote 10. Footnote 11. Yanzi, unknown to 500 BC, also known as Yan Ying, was a prime minister of the state of Qi during the spring and autumn period. End of footnote 11. Footnote 12. Zuo's Chronicles. Zuo Zuan, also known as Zuo's Commentaries on the Spring and Autumn Annals, is believed to have been written by Zuo Chu Ming. Acclaimed as one of the Chinese Confucian classics, it is one of the three commentaries on the Spring and Autumn Annals, along with Gong Yang's Commentary on the Spring and Autumn Annals. Gong Yang Juan, and Gu Liang's commentary on the Spring and Autumn Annals. Gu Liang Juan. End of footnote 12. Returning to the main text. On the planet, there are more than 200 countries and regions inhabited by over 2,500 ethnic groups with a multitude of religions. Can we imagine a world with only one lifestyle, one language, one kind of music, and one style of costume? Victor Hugo once said that there was a prospect greater than the sea, the sky. There was a prospect greater than the sky, the human soul. Indeed, we need a mind that is broader than the sky as we approach different civilizations, which serve as water, moistening everything silently. We should encourage different civilizations to respect each other and live in harmony, so as to turn exchanges and mutual learning between civilizations into a bridge promoting friendship between peoples around the world, an engine driving human society, and a bond cementing world peace. We should draw wisdom and nourishment and seek spiritual support and psychological consolation from various civilizations and work together to face down the challenges around the globe. In 1987, 20 exquisite pieces of colored glaze were brought to light from an underground tomb of Fa Min Temple in Shanxi, China. They proved to be Byzantine and Islamic relics brought to China during the Tang Dynasty. Marveling at these exotic relics, I was struck by the thought that we should appreciate their cultural significance rather than simply admiring their exquisiteness and bring their inherent spirit to life instead of merely appreciating the artistic presentation of life in the past.